Hey all, let's talk about the 4% rule, quote unquote rule. Why do I say quote unquote? Well, it's not really a rule. That's just what the industry has since called it for better or worse, I would say for worse. So stepping back, uh, 4% rule is often referenced, cited, but um, not quite understood. Many people use it. They, they partially understand it, apply it incorrectly, et cetera. So let's start briefly with, with what it is. So in the early 1990s, someone by the name of William Bengen or Bill Bengen, who was an advisor at the time, did some research. That research resulted in what the industry has since called the 4% rule. Now, Bengen never intended it to be a rule. Here's what he did. So prior to then, there wasn't really any uh, agreed upon math or science about how to take distributions from a traditional investable portfolio for people in or near retirement. The, the kind of rule of thumb at the time was, well, let's assume you have a portfolio that's 50% stocks, 50% US bonds. We'll assume the average annual return is going to be about 6%. Therefore, in theory, you can take out 6% of your portfolio and all should be good because you're just taking out the gains or the earnings every year. But it's not quite that simple. Bengen realized that, sure, if every year your portfolio gets a neat and pretty 6% gain, works like a charm. But it doesn't work that way. The markets in reality have good years, bad years, and everything in between. So Bengen's concern is what if there is a string of years, especially the early years of your retirement period, where the markets are down multiple years in a row? You're still taking out 6%, even though the market's down, your portfolio's down 5%, 10%, 15%, whatever it may be. You're really kicking your portfolio when it's down. So now it may not be able to support taking out 6% for the rest of your uh, rest of your life. So Bengen's basic approach was, let's assume the average retirement is about 30 years. So assuming you retire, you know, mid 60s, let's assume you live till 95. Um, therefore, you want your portfolio to be able to last at least 30 years before eventually it potentially runs out. So what he did was he ran a whole series of data going back starting from the 1920s. So this captures the Great Depression all the way through to the time he published this research, which was 1994, I believe. And he wanted to see for every given rolling 30 year period, what's the maximum amount of money you could have taken out your, from your portfolio at the start of retirement, and then increase that amount every year by the amount of inflation. Or if there was deflation, decrease your, your withdrawal a little bit. But for the most part, there's generally inflation more so than there's deflation. So, so he wanted to see how much could I take out initially? What percent of my initial portfolio value could I take out at the beginning of retirement? and then increase or decrease that withdrawal every year for inflation or deflation along the way, such that I want to find the largest percentage initial withdrawal that will support, at least historically speaking, not running out of portfolio any faster than 30 years. So we started at 6%. And I don't remember the, uh, the, the exact output. I, I did a full podcast episode on this, which I'll reference below. You can find a link to it in the notes of this video that further details it. But he started at 6%. And sure enough, in, in many of those rolling 30 year periods, their portfolio would have depleted in, in faster than 30 years because there were some bad years in there, such as Great Depression, such as 1970s, where there's bad markets and really high inflation, et cetera. And then he dialed it down. What about 5%? Well, they were still even withdrawing 5% initially. Uh, some of the some of the 30 year periods would have saw the, the portfolio deplete prior to 30 years. All said and done, it ends up that a 4% initial withdrawal rate was the amount that, at least historically speaking, would have lasted any of the 30-year periods beginning in 1920-something was when he first started his uh, his data set. So that's that, that was the research. That was, in a worst-case scenario, assuming that the future were to act somewhat like the past, you can take out up to 4% and rest assured, again, historically speaking, if the past you know, uh, manifests itself again in the future, you can take out 4% and, and reasonably expect to not have your portfolio deplete uh, within 30 years. Again, assuming that's the, the typical length of retirement most people would plan for. And that was it. So Bengen never actually prescribed in his research, you should do that, you should recommend that to clients. It was just simply an academic exercise. Looking back, curiosity, you know, how much could you take out at a maximum to still withstand even the worst of 30 year periods over the, the historical time set bang and looked at. That's all it was. Now the industry liked that research, rightfully so, it was good research, and latched onto it and has since called it the 4% rule. And many people have sort of bastardized it, misunderstood it and tried to apply it to, to be an actual distribution strategy. Now it's not really feasible in, in practice because it is very rigid. So for example, if you have a million dollar starting portfolio, 
the 4% rule would say if you want to reasonably uh, have some comfort that your portfolio won't run out for 30 years, you're going to take out 4% of it or $40,000 in the first year. The next year, you're going to increase it by however much inflation there was that year, and then increase it again if there's more inflation, et cetera, et cetera. If there's ever deflation, decrease it, et cetera, and that's that. Uh, you, you would invest, per, per Bengen's research, you invest the portfolio in half stocks and half bonds. Specifically, the, the uh, investments Bengen used was the stock portion was the U.S. S&P 500. So the 500 largest companies traded on U.S. stock exchanges. And the bond portion was 50% what's called intermediate term U.S. treasuries. So bonds issued by the U.S. government with uh, an intermediate maturity, generally seven to 10 years maturity on the bonds. Now, we did have, you said you can slightly dial up or dial down the stock exposure, but the base case was 50-50 stocks to bonds. So that was the 4% rule. Um, now, why am I bringing this up now? So again, check out the link to the podcast if you want to go through all much more detail. I talk about the pros, the cons, why it's not actually practical to use in reality, but that doesn't mean it's not still a helpful tool. And there's not some value to, to using it as at least a data point and coming up with a uh, portfolio of draw strategy. But I'm bringing it up now because I came across a comment on LinkedIn the other day, a few people trying to basically debunk the 4% rule saying, no, it, it wouldn't have held up, especially if you started withdrawals at the beginning of year 2000, where there were three really bad uh, stock market returns years in a row, 2000, 2001, 2002, were down years for the US stock market on the back of what was you know, the tech bubble of the late 90s. So someone's comment was, yeah, 4% rule, it's not going to hold up. Had you started in 2000, you'd be out of money by now. So that got me thinking, what would it actually have looked like had someone implemented the 4% distribution rule at the beginning of 2000? What would it look like today, specifically at the end of 2022? So 23 years later, what would it look like? And here's what I came up with. So as you can see here, this is just a quick table, um, starting with $1 million portfolio at the end of 1999. So starting withdrawals in 2000, specifically withdrawing $40,000. That's simply 4% of the $1 million uh, initial portfolio value. Again, this portfolio was invested in half stocks as, as uh, referenced by the S&P 500 and half bonds. Now, I couldn't easily find a... Um, a measure of US intermediate term treasury returns for the last 20 something years. So I'm using as a proxy what's called the Barclays US Aggregate Bond Market Index. It is largely US bonds. There is also some investment grade US corporates and some invest uh, uh, some US mortgage backed securities. But the majority, I think it's like 60% is US treasuries. And as a whole, this index is intermediate term. There's some short term stuff in there, some long term stuff, but you blend it all together, it is intermediate term. So this is a reasonable uh, proxy for that. Not not ideal, but close enough. Uh, all said and done, the, what this spreadsheet is doing is you, starting in 2000, you're taking out 40 grand from your million dollar portfolio at the beginning of the year. Therefore, you have $960,000 getting invested in this half stock, half bond mix. And that investment will, will, will have made or would have made $12,144 for that year. So at the end of the year, you would have had $972,144 in your portfolio. And now go to the next year. And I also assume at the end of the year, you rebalance your portfolio back to 50-50 because stocks and bonds move different from one another. For example, in 2000, stocks were down some, bonds were up some. So uh, at the end of 2000, you would have sold some of your bonds to buy some more stocks to get you back to 50-50 allocation. And at the beginning of 2001, you take your distribution out at the beginning of the year. And it's just simply the previous year's $40,000 increased by the 3.4% inflation there was in 2000 as measured by the CPI-U. So then in 2001, you're taking out $41,360,000 from the portfolio. And you can see in 2001, the portfolio lost over 16 grand in its investments. So it ended the year at $914,681. And then go all the way down, you can see what happened. Well, let's stop 2008, for example, really bad year. Clearly, that was the uh, sort of the worst of the tech, uh, not the tech, the uh, global financial crisis. Stock market down 37%, bond market up about five. Portfolio lost 143, almost $144,000. And you still took out 40, almost $50,000 that year in distribution. Because again, the, the uh, distributions every year have, have gone up by inflation all the while. So at the end of 2008, the portfolio had only 760, almost $761,000 in it. Doesn't look good. But 4% rule says you keep marching on. You take your distributions as is, plus or minus inflation, regardless of the value of your portfolio. So now look what would have happened. Go all the way down to 2002. 
uh, stock market clearly rebounded really strong, uh, you know, after financial crisis, there were some some flat to down years, but as a whole, ridiculously strong stock market. So all said and done at the end of 2002, the uh, person would have taken out over $65,000 in distributions in their 23rd year of this of this plan. And their portfolio would have ended with a value of $902,164. So down from the initial million dollars, but this is 23 years in, it still would have been $900,000. That's not bad. So again, the 4% rule, this isn't actually feasible because in reality, people don't live and don't take distributions and spend money in this static fixed amount with only you know inflation adjustments. Some years you spend more, some years you spend less. So you might be taking out more or less in a given year. That's called a flexible withdrawal strategy, which is much more uh, practical and able to be implemented than something as rigid and fixed as the 4% rule. But nonetheless, again, this exercise here was simply to debunk someone trying to discredit the 4% rule, saying it wouldn't have held up. Well, here it is. You know, As you saw, it held up quite well over the last 23 years. And 2000, the year 2000 was probably one of the worst starting points you could have had in recent history other than 1970s because three years of bad stock market right off the bat, plus throw in the mix 2008, you know, 37% down stock market uh, due to financial crisis. So um, I, I didn't run every other combination of years, but had you started a little earlier in the late 90s when there were some really good stock market years or start a little later, you know, after the uh, the start of the busting of the tech bubble, um, I'm assuming these results would have been even better than the, the $902,000 that the portfolio currently ended up at uh, at the end of 2002 that, that I just showed you. All right, that's it. Hope you found this informative. Take care.